Hello everybody and welcome to the channel. I've got an absolutely massive update for Overwatch here. We've got tons of stuff to cover. We've got balance changes. We've got massive changes to the way competitive works. You are going to get more avoid slots as well on your avoid list. There's loads of stuff to go over. So we're just going to get stuck into this. Let's not mess about. Let's get stuck into it. I would grab a drink as well. I've got myself some dodgy water. Hopefully it's not that dodgy. Bottle of water. <laughs> um... Yeah, you're going to need it because it's going to be a big one. Right, let's do this. Let's get stuck into it. So the first place we're going to begin uh, is with this um, new update, which is a um, a blog. It's a defense matrix blog, but uh, it includes a, a ton of stuff about competitive as well. This is actually crazy. So what we're going to do is just go through this. So to begin with, they say playing, with com uh, playing competitive with friends. Uh, Overwatch 2 has been has always been a game best played with friends. However, in competitive play, it may not always work to group up if your friends are too far from your rank. That's why we're introducing wide groups in Season 10, and you'll now be able to play with your friends in competitive no matter their rank. So this is massive, right? Now, I know what everyone's thinking. Like, what the hell? There's going to be, like, GM players and um, champion players with bronze players. Like, what the hell? This is just going to break the game. As we go through this, you will see what, what this actually means is only those wide groups are generally only playing against each other. And if there is a bronze player with a champion, let's say, Smurf in their team with them, but they actually have the champion rank, then the bronze player will literally get no rank for winning that match. But they can still play together with their friend. And this is a key component Overwatch has been missing throughout its history. You know, you cannot play with your friend if you're a better rank than them, essentially. You know, if you're miles better than them. So, yeah, there's a lot going on here. It's a massive update, honestly. So what exactly is a wide group? A wide group is when the highest and lowest ranked players are too far apart in skill tier and divisions. Any groups with diamond or lower ranked players that are more than five skill divisions apart are a wide group. Any group with master players that are more than three skill divisions apart are also wide groups. Finally, any groups that have a grandmaster or champion player are also wide groups regardless of how many skill divisions they are apart. With this new Q option comes some trade-offs. For one, Q times will be longer as we work to pair you with other wide groups using Roll Delta Tech to ensure the match is as close as possible. For example, a wide group with a Platinum player and Bronze player will be matched against another group with similar skill distribution to try and deliver the fairest match possible. However, some matches may not appear to be as balanced as you may encounter opponents who are very different in skill level than you are. Thankfully, though, such encounters won't necessarily have as much of an impact on your progress in the competitive rank. So I think what, what this is doing in this example here. So if it's like you've got a platinum player and a bronze player, let's say this the platinum player is tank and the bronze player is support. What it will try to do is find another platinum tank and a bronze support and put them on the enemy team. Now, that's probably going to be quite difficult to find. Um, and this is why they're saying the queue times will increase. But I mean, yeah, it, it's still cool to have that option. And I think overall, this is probably good for the game. There will also be a new modifier at the end of a match when playing in a wide group. It shouldn't, it wouldn't be fair for low skilled players to be directly boosted to higher ranks when they group with higher skilled players. So some groups, depending on skill gap, are likely to see little to no change in their skill progression. This helps ensure that high skilled players don't boost their lower ranked friends. And that is essential. That is massive. It's actually a massive, like, it's, that is so good. That is massive and it's amazing. Good job, Blizzard. So then we've got this kind of little graphic which sort of shows us um, what's happening with this. So um, obviously bronze, silver, gold, platinum, and diamond. They're wide groups if they're more than five divisions apart. Masters, wide if there's three. And grandmaster and champion, all groups are wide. So if they, they're joining with anybody else, it's it's a, a wide group. So players have different skill tiers for each. Hero role, damage, support, and tank. Solo players will always be matched with other solo players or narrow groups. Wide groups of four are not allowed. So there's the, the limit. You, you cannot go in with four players. And obviously, you can't just uh, fully stack a wide group then because anything above four, it will not work. And then they go on to say, solo players will only play with other solo players on narrow groups, ensuring they never play against any wide groups. This also means we won't allow a wide group of four players to queue because solo players do not join matches with wide groups. This change should encourage players not to play on alternate accounts when they want to play with their friends. You can look forward to this new update for competitive matchmaking to begin in Season 10. So that is a huge, I mean, that is huge. That's actually a massive, massive update there to the way you can group and play this game in competitive. 
massive update. And I think this that's great. I think that's, honestly, I think that's awesome. Next up, we've got an update on levers and the lever penalty. So we've already made adjustments to discourage leaving unranked games of Overwatch. And there are a few more changes coming in Season 10. We've also taken a firm stance on levers in competitive play and have a new update for that game mode as well. For unranked games, players who leave four of their last 20 games played are put on a cooldown for 20 minutes before they can queue again, with an increase to four hours if you leave at least six of their last 20 games. Um, we'll be adding two additional tiers, a five-minute penalty for leaving two of their last 20 games played and a 48-hour suspension from queuing for any matchmaking mode for those who leave 10 or more out of their last 20 games played. I mean, yeah, that's a lot. Like 50% leaving games, I mean, that, that'd be a lot. Very few players deliberately leave 50% or more games, but we think this step will help further reduce the impact leavers can have in unranked Overwatch 2 games. To work back into good standing, competitive now counts towards a player's 20 games played. This is good, actually, because if you think about it, um, you generally don't leave comp games, right? But I, I'll say this, hand over heart, I've probably left quite a lot of uh, quick play games. Because, I don't know, you, you've just got that ability to leave them, haven't you? You think, oh, you know, things are not going our way, we'll just leave. Or, like, I, I don't want to play tank no more, I'm just going to leave. You know what I mean? <laughs> Whereas comp, you would stick for the duration. So this is actually kind of nice. Because if you're being a naughty little boy in quick play, and but you never leave comp games, then you can kind of get yourself back into good standing anyway. So that's fairly good. Nice little connection there. So the lever penalties are as follows. So unranked mode... If you leave one game, you get a warning. If you leave two to three games, you get a five-minute ban. Four to five, 20-minute ban. Six to nine, four hours. Ten plus games, 48-hour ban. And this is only of your last 20 uh, played games. Now, so obviously, you will not get perma-banned from this uh, in Unranked. But obviously, having a two-day ban is pretty substantial. You know what I mean? Anyway, competitive then got a different system. So comp, one game left, 15-minute ban. Okay, two games left, two hour. Three games left, eight hour. Four games is 20 hours. Five games is a competitive season ban. And 10 games left throughout the season is also a competitive ban. Now, what this is, why this is crucial at the bottom is because this is out of your most recently played games. So you cannot... Um, I mean, this is like the total, right? So if you leave one game, then you play a bunch of games and you're fine. Then you leave another one, maybe play another 10, 20 games or whatever and play, leave another one. Basically, you hit 10, you're banned from the season. Um, so these are much stricter... Um, competitive penalties. Uh, they also go on to say, competitive play is also receiving a notable addition to its penalty system for leaving games. Players can be suspended from competitive play whenever they leave any competitive play match. Penalties start off small at 15 minutes, but quickly escalate if they repeatedly leave games and can even trigger a season ban, which will disqualify them from the remainder of that competitive season. When players complete several competitive matches, they'll work back into good standing. Now we're introducing a rule to competitive play um, that caps the total number of games you can leave in a season, regardless of how frequent it is. Players who leave 10 competitive matches in a season will be immediately banned for that season. This should help curb those players who deliberately choose to leave a match, thinking they won't have to deal with a lengthy suspension if they haven't left their most recent games played. I think this is just trying to, like, this is trying to kill those people who basically map dodge. You know what I mean? It's like, ah, uh, I'm not playing on Havana, I'll take the hit. But over a season, if you're taking the hit constantly on Havana, you're going to get banned from the season. <laughs> Remember, deliberately leaving or having a disconnection still counts as leaving. <laughs> While we understand it is often not intentional, it still greatly impacts the high stakes experience that competitive provides. While any player can have a technical issue when playing, it's important not to jump back into competitive play until you're confident that any technical issue is resolved. <laughs> if you need any help troubleshooting disconnections or crashes, go and check support. I mean, yeah, the support's never going to help you with this, are they? The support site will just be like, make sure your internet's turned on. Um, yeah, so obviously like this, there may be issues with this. I mean, there's been issues in the past where we've been getting disconnected from games, and that's Blizzard's fault. Um, but generally when that's happened, they haven't banned people. And if they have, I think they've retroactively removed them anyway because it was a server uh, issue, if they're aware of it being a server issue. But yeah, if it's just an individual issue and you've got like problems with your ISP or whatever, and then tough luck, you're just going to get banned, which is, uh, yeah. Okay, streamer protect. Now, literally 99%, 99.999% of all players don't give a crap about this. Uh, but they're actually changing this to... To, to make it how it should have been to begin with. So it was never server side. All this would do was hide the player's client side, but that meant players in your game could still see it was you. So if I was Stylosa and I've got this mode turned on in the past, 
yeah, I wouldn't look like Stylosa, but other people would know I'm Stylosa. You guys know when I play Overwatch, I'm not named Stylosa. And there's a very simple reason for that, because every game you get a lot of, um, it's, it's either one or the other, right? You get people who are like, wow, let's try. <laughs> you know what I mean? Or you get people like, lol, let's troll. And it's like, I don't want to play that game. So I changed my name. But now I can go back to be called Stylosa and I can turn this on because it's server side and they won't know who the hell I am unless I start talking. And then they'll be like, it's that idiot from YouTube and then they'll throw the game. Anyway, <laughs> let's break this down. So expanding Streamer Protect. Streamer Protect will now be called Hide My Name and will be an effective tool for all players, not just streamers. Last year, we introduced features that enable players to hide their account information on their own client with the goal of discouraging disruptive players from watching streamers and attempting to queue into that streamer's game. However, this did not address harassment issues for players who are better known. No, it was a waste of time. We literally had to pay for name changes. It's crazy. Anyway, when you activate... But I understand this is literally an issue like hardly anybody had right in the past, but whatever. When you activate Hide My Name, your battle tag will appear as one of several dozen randomly generated battle tags Crusher 99 will never, will never, <laughs> it will never be forgotten. <laughs> of course, from the Overwatch League uh, promotional stuff when that was launched, uh, if, if you're not aware. Anyway, uh, with uh, Serena Williams, I believe. Uh, anyway, ranging from Crusher 99 to Garlic Bread, the best bread, and many other fun references from Overwatch 2 and our community. Uh, this name will be displayed not only for your own game client, but also for all other players in the lobby. After the match, players can see everyone's actual battle tags by checking the social menu. Okay, so you can see who you've played with by checking the social menu, but in the game you won't know. And I think that's fine, right? Uh, that's okay. Uh, don't worry if you counter, encounter disruptive players and are unsure if they uh, if they are using a covered battle tag, you can still report any player you encounter during or and after the match, which will be reported to that player's account. So even though you're using this system, it's not hidden from Blizzard, obviously. They can see your account details, and they'll still ban you. So, so you know, just keep reporting, and off you go. But I think what will happen is people will get used to seeing these random generated names because there can't be too many of them, and they'll probably have a format. It's probably similar to what you get when you click randomly generate on the battle net, uh, name tag thing anyway. Um, so yeah, people will get used to it, but like, oh, I've got a bunch of names in my game. And obviously the higher ranked you get, the more like pronounced this issue becomes because players, you know, the player base is smaller, but yeah, for most of us, I think this is a pretty good change. Um, especially if you're a one trick and, uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Let's get stuck into this now. So this is expanding avoid a teammate. And this is beautiful. This is something everybody has been asking for for literally years, right? And it's really clever what they're doing here. So avoid as teammate allows players to choose to not be paired with specific players on the same team when finding a match. This is a good way to step away from disruptive players or players with a different play style than yours. In a future update, you'll be able to add 10 players to your avoid a teammate list. For most players below Grandmasters, this will likely allow you to avoid all 10 players on your list. Those on the higher end of the ladder may still see some of your avoided players that are lower in priority, especially when your queue times get longer. Now, this is the cool thing. You've got a priority to your list now. You can sort of see it in the graphic here, but we'll get onto this. It's so cool. So the current avoid as teammate system allows you to avoid up to three players you encounter. This has been the maximum because adding more slots would make finding matches for players at higher ranks like GM and champion impossible. However, thanks to your feedback, we are going to give everyone more agency over which players they are paired with on their team. To better tailor your experience, you can toggle which players you absolutely don't want to play with versus those you would rather avoid if you can help it. When your list is full and you want to avoid a new player, they will be added automatically, dropping the player who's been on the list the longest. Don't worry, you can pin any players to ensure they don't fall off your list. This will enable a smoother user experience and allow you to get back into the queue faster. So I think what's going on here is the pinned players, are ba this is basically the current system, right? So if you avoid three players, you'll, you won't get them in a team and that's it. But then what they're saying is you can have another seven players. But what we're going to do, because we're worried at higher ranks that if you literally had 10 players that you, you, you know you'd avoided, you'll never get a game. Well, they're going to do this priority system where player nine it will be the least likely to be avoided so player six has got a much higher chance of being avoided. But maybe, you know, 
this player, you, you can accept them on your team. Maybe sometimes they're only slightly annoying. But these three are like the mega throwers, the players you don't want on your team, the toxic assholes. So they're totally banned forever. You don't want them gone. And that's not going to change on the list. Uh, and then these players are just down in order of severity. Whether you don't, you don't, you clearly don't like player six, probably won't get matched with them. And as you go down, the chance increases that you might get matched with them. So I think this is quite a elegant fix to this, especially considering like if they increase the hard cap on avoiding players, that it would just literally break the game and no one would ever get games over a certain rank. But yeah, I think that's pretty cool. Next up is disruptive chat. So this is mitigating disruptive chat. We never consider it acceptable for anyone to harass, insult, or abuse any other players through chat. We've already taken many steps to identify disruptive chat faster and take action in cases of clearly identified disruptive chat. And soon we'll have more updates to improve the chat experience for all players. When a player is action for disruptive chat or not playing fairly in the game, we demote their endorsement rate into level zero. Even new players start at level one, so you can only reach this level if you are action for breaking the rules. Okay. Coming later this year, we are going to prevent anyone with a level zero endorsement rating from using any text or voice chat in their matches. These privileges can be restored once the player reaches level one again, which is done by playing to your best, helping your team and communicating. Okay. Um, we also recognize that some players like being disrupted to others while they spectate their friends' uh, matches. Since it's not possible to report spectators who are disruptive on console and very limited on PC, access to team and match chat channels will be removed. Friends can still chat with each other through a whisper. Okay, so you can still send direct messages to each other, but you can't actually spectate chat over games anymore because they don't really have a good way of, um, I guess, monitoring that and on offering uh, reporting for it. So yeah, interesting changes there. Faster reporting. So every day we work to action disruptive players and correct inappropriate behavior in our games. And your reports help us with this. However, we understand that it's not easy to report when you are in the middle of a match. We're designing an easy to use interface that should enable all players to report as soon as they see disruptive behavior. And we look forward to sharing more late this year. So we're going to have some like rapid report system. <laughs> Remember, when you report a player as being abusive in either text chat, uh, or voice chat as soon as possible. It's easier for our systems to better identify that player. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. And remember as well, it, when you report people, if someone says something like ridiculous over voice chat and you report them, the game actually um, transcribes what they're saying over voice chat and then saves it so Blizzard can check it. So it's always kind of worth reporting as soon as you hear like abusive voice chat, like immediately report. But yeah, this is good. Like any anything which increases reports or the ease of reporting, not increases reports, I guess. It's not what I'm looking to say, but increases the ease of actually getting a report off, I think makes sense. Because sometimes you just forget, don't you? Or you're just like, I can't be bothered. You move on. And then that player might go on to disrupt more games where maybe your report could have been the one that took that player down. Now, this is weird. This is like, it, you guys must have seen player surveys floating around in the past for Overwatch. Uh, they generally do them in Germany for some reason. But you will often, well, I say often, sometimes you'll get a, a survey sent from like a third party company. And it'll just ask you like, what do you think about the prices of Overwatch skins? Now, when I get these, I just send back laughing emojis back to them. <laughs> but like when you get them, sometimes, they, well, sometimes they can actually leak uh, <laughs> common content to the game, which is funny. But basically, um, it's a way of trying to collect uh, the, the responses to certain questions from the player base. Instead of Blizzard going out and just like, you know, looking at all the various social media or whatever, they can ask specific questions. And especially if, maybe if something has happened in that game, like maybe you're playing a new game mode and it says, hey, what do you think about the game mode game length, right? Is it good or bad? Let us know. So I think this is kind of cool. But anyway, we're always watching for your feedback, <laughs> whether it's on social media, through communities from our top content creators, or other places of note. And we continue st striving to make Overwatch 2 a safer and more inclusive experience for all players. We're providing a new way for players to help make their voices heard. We'll be introducing new player surveys into Overwatch 2. We'll randomly choose players whenever they complete a match after the end of match flow, including the player of the game and your progression updates. If you are selected, you will be prompted by a new splash screen with an invitation to participate in an optional survey that you can access by clicking the link or scanning the QR code. Okay. You'll have your chance to let us know what you think about new modes, events, and features, along with telling us how we can help protect you from disruptive players. Okay, interesting. And then they just say, thanks. And uh, uh, oh, oh, well, they do say, to recap, our changes to grouping up with friends in competitive leave penalties updates and improved stream and protect launches in Season 10 
and the other features and more are coming in following seasons. Okay, so that's the update on that stuff, which is a ton of stuff, but let's move on. Okay, so this is Aaron Keller, uh, and it is a director's take welcoming venture to Overwatch, but this includes some balance changes as well, or at least teasers to balance changes. So what are we going to expect? I mean, spoiler alert, Venture is being nerfed from the preview Venture that we got, which is no surprise. <laughs> anyway, hello, it's been a while since my last blog. We've been hard at work. Let's get right into it. First off, I am thrilled that you have welcomed our newest hero, Venture, to the lineup. Venture's ecstatic personality has charmed many of you, and you have already asked us so many questions about their backstory and personality. While I'm unsure if they like to munch on rocks, they have drilled their way into being the top-picked hero in quick play this past weekend. Literally any new hero would be the top pick, wouldn't they? <laughs> Unless they were horrifically terrible, but Venture is actually amazing. We'll be revealing more about Venture's story and how they were developed shortly after Season 10. Okay, looking forward to that call. One of the biggest reasons so many of us instantly fell in love with Venture is the incredible voice talent of Valeria Rodriguez. We instantly knew they were a hit when we saw how much energy they could put into their voice and how they matched Venture's personality perfectly. We're also thrilled that many of you have welcomed Valeria into our community. Watching all of your reactions from the Hero Trial, we're pretty happy with how Venture's initial kit turned out. The team was really happy with where Venture landed from a balanced perspective during the trial, and it gave us confidence that they could release early into competitive. Oh, this is good. Okay, actually, this is actually really cool. Just, just just, put them in competitive straight away, honestly, because we've already had the trial. Just do it. Just do it. Um, we're still deciding how early, but we feel they are in a suitable state, fun to play and fair to play against. While we don't foresee needing to make many changes to their kit, we're going to be listening closely to your thoughts on how Venture is doing in-game. Okay, okay, that's pretty cool. So what about Venture nerfs? Okay, well, we've heard a lot of feedback that you like the tempo momentum Venture brings, being able to engage and disengage in fights. We're looking at tweaking a few things for Venture at the start of Season 10. First, we're slightly shifting some of their burst damage from their drill dash and clobber, the melee, into damage over time. Next, we're looking to reduce the vertical knockback of Tectonic Shock alongside those minor changes to Venture. We have a number of other hero changes coming in Season uh, 10. Okay, so I, to be honest, I don't think this is exactly a shock because Venture had crazy burst in the trial. So hopefully they still keep the same sort of overall damage. But as Aaron says, it's just being pushed to sort of damage over time. So you're still going to do the damage, but it's not going to be as fast. So hopefully that, that means they're still as interesting to play as they were. But I think they will. Because it's the movement with Venture. It's just amazing. It feels so good. So what about tank changes coming in Season 10? Okay, there looks to be a ton of info here. So starting with tanks, we're upping the impact of Junker Queen's Carnage and Reinhardt's Earth Shatter. So both abilities cut through better in the post-Season 9 world. The biggest tank changes coming in Season 10, though, are for Wrecking Ball. There are some great improvements to Wrecking Ball's grappling hook, including a reduced cooldown when not entering ramming speed, so that's when you're on fire, and the ability to retract himself to where the grapple is attached to. <laughs> that's actually pretty cool, actually. That's going to give him quite a few... That's going to make him way more mechanical. That's actually really cool, guys. Um, where am I? I've totally lost my mind. Uh, yeah, the ability to retract himself to where the grapple is attached by holding down primary fire or jump. There are also some changes to adaptive shields. Now, after using adaptive shields, you can reactivate the ability to transfer up to 300 overhealth to nearby allies. Okay, it's capped at 75 per ally. I was going to say, what? You can transfer 300 to what? Can you, like, can you imagine Ball and Tracer in the back line, and then Balls like have 300 over health. Tracer, that would be crazy. To be honest, 75 is going to be crazy. This is, this is, sounds mental. This change should give Wrecking Ball more capability of protecting his allies and initiating engagements, defining features of what we want to see in tanks. That's actually massive. That for Wrecking Ball could be massive. Like, I mean, the Tracer example, yeah. But this sort of adds another element of like, you can think, actually, I'm going to jump back to my team now and give them the shields. Because 75, you know, that's not... That's no mug amount, is it? You know, that's a decent amount of shields, that is. That's actually pretty good. Well, of, of overhealth, I should say. That's actually pretty good, that is. 
So moving on to damage heroes. Um, for damage heroes, there will be some light adjustments for Sombra and Tracer. Sombra's virus damage is taking a small hit on the damage over time amount, 100 to 90, since the ability now has more upfront burst. Tracer's been quite strong since the Season 9 changes. She's one of the least touch heroes in Overwatch's history. True. Her kit flows spectacularly well. We are looking at some light changes for her right now to make her slightly more punishable and require more precision. Again, I don't know what this could be. I mean, this could be changes to a, um, a spread, maybe, of a primary fire. And something to do with recall. Pulse bomb changes as well. I don't know. But yeah, th that, it's interesting to see that Tracer and Sombra are the ones that are getting targeted. Okay, moving on to support heroes. We are looking at shifts in power for Moira, Lucio, and Iliari. That means taking power from one part of their kit and funneling it into another. To somewhat maintain the overall power budget of the hero. Iliari, for example, is receiving a slight nerf to her primary fire recovery time, 0.2 to 0.25 seconds, but giving more power back to her secondary fire heal and increase its heal per second from 105 to 115. There are also some light buffs for Life Weaver as we continue to evaluate where healthy power can be injected into his kit. You know, Iliari, I, I, isn't Iliari's problem the, the healing pylon? It's not the damage. I mean, the damage and, and the... The, the alternate fire heal. I mean, it's the healing pylon, right? I don't know. Like, Iliari to me still seems like kind of a weak hero, but I'd be lying if I said I've been playing a ton of support in Overwatch recently because I haven't. But yeah, I did play her a ton when she came out and she was crazy good, although she did get nerfed. But yeah. Yeah, and then Aaron wraps this up with, uh, many of you may have seen the recent developer update this month and we're just as excited as you are for those changes, including heroes no longer being locked behind the battle pass. We're incredibly excited for about Season 10 and we've got some more changes that will make Overwatch more fun for everyone next season. Uh, we have another developer update coming out tomorrow. This, this That's the one we've been through, <laughs> which will touch on things we're doing for competitive and updates on what we're doing uh, to help make Overwatch more safe and inclusive space for everyone. Okay, all right. But we've still got something else to talk about and this is funky as uh, all hell. So check this out. Blizzard Entertainment and NetEase renew agreement to bring beloved titles back to China. Microsoft Gaming, NetEase enter broader, broader collaboration. This is the return of Overwatch, of Warcraft, of WoW, of Starcraft, of Hearthstone, and Heroes of the Storm. Don't forget Heroes of the Storm. Back to China. Because, of course, the games have not been playable in China for a long time now after the disaster of uh, whatever the hell happened. And I hope at some point we get all of the details behind that. <laughs> anyway, let's just go through this. A press release. Blizzard have just dropped this. So Blizzard titles return to mainland China beginning summer 2024. Microsoft Gaming and NetEase deepen their relationship with a strategic partnership based on their shared desire to bring new gaming experiences to players across platforms and markets. Uh, so yeah, yeah, Irvine, California, blah, 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 blah. Beloved video game titles from Blizzard Entertainment that captivated millions of players in China will return to the market sequentially beginning this summer under a renewed publishing deal. After continuing discussions over the past year, both Blizzard Entertainment and NetEase are thrilled to align on a path forward to once again support players in mainland China and are proud to reaffirm their commitment to delivering exceptional gaming experiences. I mean, I guess the thing before I carry on with this, can you imagine how devastating it would be if you just suddenly didn't have access to your favorite games? It would be, I mean, especially like MMO games. You know, a lot of people, you, you become connected to your MMO characters, especially Warcraft. So if you're sitting there playing WoW and it's like suddenly one day, sorry, the character you've played for literally 20 years is no longer playable. You would, you'd be like, what? You what, mate? You know what I mean? And that's basically what happened. It was insane. But given the size of the Chinese market, it was always odds on that one of the first things Microsoft would do is try and get that market back. You know, Overwatch wants this market. We had a lot of Overwatch League teams from China. And obviously, when the game wasn't legally allowed to be played in China, then a lot of those teams are just simply not interested. I think uh, Guangzhou, Spark, I think they just totally left. Was it Hanzhou? I can't remember. But it basically, Spark, the pink team. I can't even remember the name of the teams. The pink team just was like, whatever, we're not even going to bother. <laughs> Oh, no, it wasn't the pink team. Hang on. No, it was Chengdu. Chengdu disappeared as well, didn't they? Oh, well, they all disappeared. But yeah, what? The, I mean, that is insane. Isn't it? Anyway, uh, the renewed publishing agreement will encompass games Chinese players had access to under the previous agreement. World of Warcraft, Hearthstone, and other titles, Warcraft, Overwatch, Diablo, and StarCraft universes. Building upon more than 15 years of past collaboration, Blizzard and NetEase are working diligently on relaunch plans. Separately, Microsoft Gaming and NetEase have also entered into an agreement to explore bringing new NetEase titles to Xbox. Okay. 
We at Blizzard are thrilled to re-establish our partnership with NetEase because uh, we want the money <laughs> and to work together with deep appreciation for the collaboration between our teams uh, to deliver legendary gaming experiences in China, said Johanna Ferries, president of uh, Blizzard Entertainment. We are immensely grateful for the passion the Chinese community has shown for Blizzard games throughout the years. And we're focused on bringing our universes back to players. Yeah. Celebrating our collaborations, we are thrilled to embark on the next chapter built on trust and mutual respect. Um... Our community providing exhilarating creative entertainment, yada, yada. Blizzard, Blizzard, love it. And Phil Spencer says, Blizzard and NetEase have done an incredible incredible work to renew our commitment to players. Blizzard's universe has been part of players' lives in the region for many years. Returning Blizzard's legendary games to players in China while exploring ways to bring more new titles to Xbox demonstrates our commitment to bringing in more games and players around the world, said Phil Spencer, the big boss man. Okay, so there we go, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you enjoyed that because um, there was a lot to cover in that video. And season 10 is... I mean, I'm really looking forward to this because I just want to play Venture. I think they are like an incredible hero. The kit is amazing. And it's been a while since I've really just gone in and played DPS uh, in Overwatch. And so I am looking forward uh, just to seeing how they fit into competitive and all of that stuff. It's going to be great. Hopefully Blizzard just give us access to them immediately in comp or like uh, uh, give us a day and then just let us go. Because <laughs> we know how to play the hero, but we just need to refine it and get better. But yeah, a massive video, like I said, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, let me know what you think about all of this in the comments below. And uh, as ever, thank you for all the support on the channel. And uh, do leave a comment, subscribe to the channel, like the video because that helps an absolute ton. And uh, yeah, let me know what you think about all of this in the comments below. What is the thing you are most looking forward to coming in Season 10? Because it looks like there's a ton of updates. And of course, you've got to remember things like the, uh, this, the, 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 the new way the Mythics are going to be um, earned in Season 10 is coming in. And we need to work out what that's going to look like. Uh, and, you know, are there going to be other changes? I think there's a currency, isn't there, in the Battle Pass? I can't quite remember. What is it? Like, there's like some fancy mythic currency thing or whatever. We're going to need to see how that plays out before we can comment on it, but it's going to be interesting nonetheless. All right, guys, thanks for watching the video, and I'll catch you lovely lot on the next one. See you soon.